Yeah. Over like the first meeting. It did. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
are to look for warning signs. What might we see? What might we recognize that would be a warning that somebody's thinking about suicide? To intervene, it's not easy to ask somebody what's going on or what's if they're thinking of suicide, but to be bold in our attempts to do that. To make sure they get early referrals to professionals, right? We have lots of students in here, three, um, you know, I don't know. Allison and I are both registered nurses. Your instructor has a degree in psychology. Um, so lots of experience, but that doesn't make us professionals in terms of mental health, right? We need to get them to a therapist, to a mental health professional that can get them some support. And then stigma. How many people think there's stigma related to mental health? Heck yeah. So the more we talk about it, the more we confront it, the less that stigma is. <laughs> that mind of a dose. Remember that it's not counseling. None of us are counselors, right? Unless somebody got a magic degree overnight. It's not me. Um, and we know that hope is one of the first things people start to lose when they're suicidal. So we want to offer hope by being engaged, by offering positive interaction. <clears throat> we know that culture matters. <coughs> Excuse me. We know that people may not seek care, may not talk about their feelings, may not um, share what's going on because of their race, because of their culture, because of things that are attached to it, specifically stigma. Okay, so we know that you could, we know that people are less likely to talk about it in certain cultures. So as gatekeepers, which is what they call the people who are helping, um, have to sometimes do more and recognize that people may not be forthcoming. So they don't wanna be labeled as crazy, okay? We know that it's different in different races and cultures, right? We know that we see more depression in Latin women compared to Latin men. Although because of the cultural issue in, in the Latin population, they may not be forthcoming about feeling depressed. So this may be hugely underrated. Okay, we know that they're less likely to um, express themselves or offer symptoms if they're first generation versus somebody that's been in the States for a while. Lack of health care in the appropriate cultures and race. Sometimes we feel like we need somebody of our culture, our race, maybe our, our color, our, our religious belief to understand what we're going through. We see it a lot in vets. They often don't believe that they can be helped with somebody who's not a vet they wouldn't understand and that happens that's normal that it goes on in race cultural it, it breaks all those boundaries um we know that black boys are 10 to 13 10 to 13 or two to, to three times more likely to die by suicide than their white counterparts this is significant right this is scary so if we're dealing with somebody who's black we definitely want to make sure that we're paying attention that they may be at higher risk than somebody else, okay? Difference in Hispanics, nine to 12, are greatest risk of attempting than black and white. So lots of different things to think about and talk about, right? Um, it's the leading cause of death among Asian Americans, 20 to 24. Okay? It's a huge, huge thing, 20 to 24, and the leading cause of death is suicide. In most people, like what is it, 14 to 35, I think, it's the third leading cause of death. So COVID's kind of jumped in there along the way. It was the second, and then it dropped to three. So it can be really um, significant depending on that cultural standard, right? So it's important that we recognize maybe they don't talk about these feelings at home because it's not appropriate in their home. Okay, so we may be some of the only people they have a chance to talk about their feelings. Okay. Um, we don't do a lot of research based on culture or based on race. Sometimes we throw everybody together in one lump sum, but we don't have any statistics or research that's based specifically on that cultural race. Okay, so that's something to be aware of. A lot of our research studies, a lot of the assumptions we have are based on either a mixed population or a primarily white population. That can make a really big difference. So what about statistics in general? Okay, so 
The US government is always a few years behind. So these are the latest statistics, believe it or not. So remember that these may not have a total reflection of what's gone on since COVID started. Okay, maybe the beginning of it, but not a, a whole lot. 126 suicides a day. Okay, that's a lot. So it was the second leading death, second leading cause of death um, in 10 to 34, close, 14 to 34, close. Um, it was replaced, homicide replaced it in um, by suicide. Homicide was replaced by suicide. I mean, vice versa, vice versa. Suicide was replaced by homicide. Okay, that doesn't make you suicide. I'm not sure what would, right? So the highest risk for suicide is middle-aged, primarily white males, 45 to 54. And you see it in the news, right? It, it's kind of something if you turn the news on on those days or you flip on the computer and you get on one of the news sites and it says, you know, this man came home from work and took out his family a lot of times and himself. Right? We saw that a lot <clears throat> a number of years ago when the recession hit, and now they're saying we're heading back into a recession. So that may change our numbers significantly. Okay. <clears throat> we know that it's the 11th, 11th leading cause of death in the US in 12. Okay. COVID is now the third in the US in California. Um, ideation, planning, number of attempts is highest in the 18 to 25 years. So that's most everybody in here, right? Including me. So this is what this is why we can talk about it, because this is a high risk time. You did laugh because it's not true, right? <laughs> right. So the highest risk of suicide rates, or the highest rate of suicide, excuse me, is in white males. Okay. But we know those things are changing. We're seeing that. LGBTQ attempts five times the rate of their heterosexual individuals. If they come out to their family and their friends and they are rejected, that number jumps to eight and a half times more. Than Huge. And this is a time that a lot of people start to come out, start to talk about those things. You start to get comfortable. You're starting to be in an environment where that's a little more accepted, although things are getting better. Right? So aware of somebody that comes out, a family member, a friend, that we need to be on top of it, especially if they're rejected by their own family. Okay? We know suicide in veterans is huge. We haven't talked about that briefly, right? Another population that kind of talked about, you know, you suck it up and you go forward. You don't talk about this is really hard and this really sucks. Don't do that. Okay. We know that firearms account for almost 53% of completed suicides. Okay. It's the most common suicide um, weapon use that, that leads to completion. We don't use the word success because we don't consider it success, right? So, what about COVID? Well, Again, we're at the end of June 20, and we're like in almost November of 22. So we're kind of old, but this is what we have. Increased struggling with mental health and substance abuse. We were locked up at home. We had no social outlet. We were doing a lot of nothing, right? So what did we do? We did some escape mechanisms, whether that was alcohol or drugs or the computer, kind of which drew in the world, okay? Increase. 12% from 2018, okay? Depression symptoms, okay? So going up, 20% increase for the quarter of June 2019, okay? So you can read through all these statistics. I know you guys can all read, but the reality is, is that we're seeing a huge increase. And as we get further along in COVID, the numbers keep kind of going up, at least from what we're seeing in, on campus. Right, we're talking to kids and have a more increase in people who are asking for mental health care, are asking for therapy, are asking for support to get through, and a lot of it can be related back to being in COVID for so long. You know, one day you're wearing a mask, one day you're not. Here you're wearing a mask, here you're not. Oh my gosh, our brains are like on overload, right? So lots of increases in mental health needs in the last couple of years, and we kind of expect that to. We expected that to happen and we expect it to climb. Okay. So, undiagnosed and untreated depression is the number one cause for suicide. So, maybe somebody has been diagnosed with depression, but they're undertreated. So, that can increase the risk. 
Okay. If they say they're hopeless, that's a big clue that they're thinking about suicide. When you feel like there's nothing more I can do, there's nothing anybody can do to help me, suicide is often the first not first, but it's ultimately their thought. Okay, so what are the differences in these two brains? This is a CT scan, and on the left is a depressed brain, and on the right is not depressed. It's a difference. Say it again. Brain activity. Brain activity. Right, right. On the not depressed brain, right? Yeah. So if you're thinking about somebody who's depressed, and you can kind of picture this, their brains aren't physically functioning. So it's really hard to say, you're going to make these decisions. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. They don't have that functioning capability. Whereas on our good days, when we're not depressed, we're thinking pretty good. We can think of options. We can think of solutions. We can look at alternatives. But you have to recognize someone who's depressed may not be able to do that. It is a physiological incapability. So I think this is such a great slide. Okay, so you guys all know somebody that has had depression or um, or yourself. So tell me some symptoms that you might see for depression. Yeah. Isolation. Isolation, absolutely. They withdraw from people. They may withdraw from classes. Absolutely, yeah. Like tiredness. Fatigue, how many in here pulled an all-nighter? Couple of us. Yeah. How do you feel the next day? You feel fantastic, ready to go? No, right? You're completely brain dead, right? So think about somebody who is maybe fatigued but hasn't slept. And then you add this. How well do you think they function? Not so great. And that's a lot of times what happens is that we see people who are depressed and they're not sleeping or they're sleeping all the time. But if somebody's not sleeping, you need to get them rest because you're dealing with something that they can't function at all, right? That that next day I stayed up all night to study kind of feeling it's off. Okay, what else? Yeah. Lack of interest in other things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Nothing is fun anymore. Nothing is joyful. You have no motivation to go and do something. Absolutely. Anything else? No. Okay, so let's lack of eye thinking or do stuff. Could be, yeah, absolutely. They kind of came to class looking pretty slick, and then all of a sudden they're in their yeah, absolutely. Okay. So yeah, definitely, definitely. There's that back to that some of that motivation. We just don't have that emphasis to get yourself going in the morning, much less if you're not sleeping. Who wants to get out of bed and do more? Right? Not many people. Okay, so let's go through what we haven't seen. So we talked about interest. Heightened emotions. So they're swinging around. Maybe they're easily frustrated, easily angered, or that's not their norm. Remember, these are changes from kind of their baseline. Most of the time, these are going to be people you know. These are going to be family members. These are going to be friends. These are going to be coworkers. They're going to be somebody that you know. So you're going to kind of know what their baseline is, right? So you're going to see change in their emotions. They might feel sad or guilty. Maybe they've caused a lot of grief in the house, okay? We talked about fatigue, changes not only in sleeping patterns, but eating patterns. They might start eating a whole bunch or they might not eat at all. Both ends of the spectrum, so you have to look at both. Obviously, we talked about concentrated making decisions. If you're not sleeping, you're not eating, and your brain is blue, clearly you're not going to be great at making decisions. Okay? Withdrawing, we talked about that. Helpless or hopeless, if they're saying things, if they're writing in a text, if they're writing on Instagram, whatever. That they're feeling helpless or hopeless. That's a good clue. They may talk about suicide or death, or wishing to be dead, right? And we see that more and more on, you know, social media. Sometimes we see it in people's papers here on campus. You know, instructors will bring papers to us or texts or emails that they get. Somebody's kind of talking about that. Okay, so we know that myths are things that we believe in, and they can often prevent us from doing something that we should act on. So we need to dispel some. No one can stop a suicide, it's inevitable, right? You can see it's myth. Would we be standing here if we thought that was true, right? It would be pointless for us to say, hey, you can help stop a suicide if we didn't believe that, um, it, that, that you can stop a suicide, right? We wouldn't come here. Confronting a suicide will only make them angry and increase their risk of suicide. 
This one's a little tricky, right? So one thing, could they get angry? Yeah, they could. Uh, Allison and I are here to tell you 99.99999% of the time that doesn't happen. Okay. You ask somebody about suicide and you can almost see the relief in their shoulders, not because they feel better and they don't want to think about suicide anymore, but because somebody else knows, right? Somebody else is connected. Somebody else is involved in this. And that's really important. Okay. So in, I've been here, this is my 23rd year here. And one person in my entire career has gotten angry. And let me tell you, she was ticked. She was screaming and yelling. Did that change anything? Absolutely not. She was ticked because we interrupted her plan. Had a big plan to take her back that day. So we kind of got in the middle of it. She wasn't happy with us. How about increase their risk? If you ask somebody, you think it increases their risk? The research says no, you are not planting a seed. So if I come to you and I say, what's your name? I'm sorry, Andre. Andres, are you thinking about suicide? And you say to me, oh my God, great idea. Why did you do that? That's not how this works. We're not planting that seed. Okay. So remember that asking somebody is not going to trigger them. Okay. The research shows actually the opposite increases their risk. Okay. Experts can prevent suicide. Again, nothing that we we know that we had students, we trained in students and faculty and staff in this for years, and we've had them come back and go, this happened to me, I used it, and it worked. So we know it works, okay? They keep their plans to themselves. 80% of people will tell you that they're thinking about suicide, maybe not directly, but in some way, two weeks prior to their, in two weeks, somewhere in the two weeks prior to their attempt. It doesn't always go noticed, right? It may go kind of under the radar, and a lot of people go, oh, that was a sign. In retrospect, oh, I didn't see that, right? We are here to move forward. We are not here to look back and say, oh, should have, would have, could have, right? So remember that, you know, they generally tell you something is going on, not everybody, right? There are cases where people up and take their lives and don't give warnings, okay? So it does happen, but it's less likely than it than most people do say, okay, um, those who talk about it don't do it. Some people talk more than others, okay? Just because somebody says it a lot doesn't mean they're not going to cry. And just because they don't talk about it doesn't mean they shouldn't be asked about it, okay? So both sides. Um, we know that once a person decides to commit suicide, we can intervene, right? We can help make a difference. They're in that hopeless moment, and we can intervene and make things different, okay? It's the most preventable kind of death, right? It takes inner standing up and saying something, letting them know somebody that you're there, okay? Culture plays a difference, and we know that, and we need to be aware of that, okay? No cultures are immune. There is no culture on this earth that doesn't have suicide there. Okay. They're both. Okay. So suicide clues and warning signs. The more signs you see, the greater the risk, right? So some people are very verbal. This is not the norm, I'm here to tell you, okay? I've decided to kill myself. Most people are not that blatant, okay? I'm gonna end it all. Maybe a little bit more on that one. I'm done, I'm finished, I'm not doing this again. Okay, what does that really mean, okay? However, the bottom one we do see on occasion, and if such and such doesn't happen, I'll kill myself. I'll tell you a really quick story. And we had a student years ago who's in a math class, sitting in the back corner, and instructor was handing back exams. And he's kind of a quiet guy, didn't really talk a lot. But when the exams got handed back, he said, if I don't get an A in this class, I'm gonna kill myself. Okay, I don't know about you guys in math, but it is not my strong suit. Okay, so obviously be happy, like I have passed. Hey, oh my God, I got a C. So it's like, right? So you can see where it would be really easy if I was sitting next to that guy, I'd be like, oh my God, okay, seriously? I'm so happy. I got a C. So, but the students around him were smarter than I am, and they thought it was strange. So they told the instructor, the instructor contacted the student health center, and we were able to approach this young man who was absolutely serious. He had a plan to take his life if he took an A in the class. Why would an A be so important? What are grades about? 
in your own college. Or like a representation of your success in the classroom. Absolutely, right? What's the goal when you leave more for college? To say again? To graduate. To graduate, maybe transfer. Right. Absolutely, get a job. Right. Absolutely. What about parents? Can parents play a role in our grades sometimes? Yeah. Right. Culture, play a role sometimes? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's what was going on with this young man. Number one, he wanted to go to med school. We thought the B in math would end that possibility. Family had high expectations that he would go to med school. Okay, he had high expectations of himself. So all these pressures were on him to get this great. So thankfully, it has a happy ending. We were able to get family involved. They were very supportive. He got a B in math. Okay, but you know what? I hope he's off being a doctor because he got it. He was good, understood, knew what it felt like to be really distressed. And I think that's such a great quality sometimes. Okay, this is much more what we're likely to see. I just want out. Be around much longer. What's that mean? That's right. You're moving, You're dropping out of school. So we might need to ask more questions if these things come up. Okay, so it's really common for somebody you won't have to worry about. How am I not to worry about? Okay, so lots of things that they may say that we might want to push a little further, especially if we've seen some of those symptoms ahead of time. It's a good correlation. The other thing you want to be really cautious of when you're talking about suicide is. Somebody's been really down and really kind of sad. Maybe they're not hanging out with you. Maybe they're not in class. Notice they're not eating or sleeping. And the next day they come in and they're like, hey, how's it going? Everything's great. Ah, oh, everything's fine. I'm, I'm through it all. It's good. The risk in that kind of behavior, you're kind of thinking, great, they got through it. No problem. But a lot of times the concern is they've made the decision to take their life. And that brings them relief from all that pain and anxiety that they're feeling. So they seem like they're better. The reality is their plan is in place. So be cautious when somebody makes a flip like that. Okay. Um, these could be cultural. These could be familial. I'm not going to live past 21. Okay. No man in my family is going to live past 21. My mom and my grandma died at 21. Okay. I'm sick and tired of everybody and everybody's sick. Okay, right? things are rough, right? Okay, so it depends on what's going on. What other things are you seeing around this? So pay attention to, to comments like this that you're like, really sure what that is. Why are you sure what class is going on? Okay. Behavioral clues. We know that anybody who's attempted suicide in the past is much more likely to attempt again. So if you know they've had an attempt in the past, Important to pay attention. Okay, they're they're using methods. They're looking at methods, stockpiling pills, putting weapons in place. Okay, especially if that's not normal for them. Okay, they've got depression. They're moody. They're talking about being hopeless. Putting personal affairs in order. Okay, well, my kids are either in college or or through college, right? Is it normal for me to put my personal affairs in order? He's going to get the house. He's going to get the car. He's going to get the dog. You know, those kinds. At my age, that's normal, right? Is that normal in an 18 year old? Probably because we don't have much at 18. People do. Okay. So look at the appropriateness. Okay. Giving away prized possessions. You know, that when people start to give away things that mean a lot to them, because they're thinking they aren't going to need them anymore. It's not worth it. Okay. Um, there's a change in their interest of religion, so they may become really interested or disinterested when they were normally, you know, going to church or whatever, okay? Alcohol and drug abuse. Know the risk for somebody who's had an addiction problem in the past, been in recovery, and relapsed, amps up. I can't remember the statistic off the top of my head. I can't remember what it is, but it hugely raises the risk of suicide. Okay, they're feeling bad enough, numbing it out, and come off of it when they're on it and we have new inhibitions, and they're much more likely to do it. Unexplained anger, aggression, irritability, something that's not normal. Okay, they might be talking or writing about death. Okay, again, social media, maybe a paper from English class or psychology class. Okay, so we may see these things. 
Risky activities at this age in our 18 to 25 year olds with high risk group, pretty normal, right? But we're looking for change. All of a sudden, you know, they've been drinking maybe two beers when you go out, now they're having a sleep. They were getting a designated driver, they were taking Uber, Lyft, whatever. Now they're taking their keys with them. Okay, changing those risky activities. Okay. Being fired, suspended, moving when you don't want to, especially if it's kind of far away from what you know is normal. Okay, loss of a major relationship. A lot of this, this is a big trigger, right? Get those first relationships that are kind of serious for a while, and then for whatever reason they end. This causes so much sadness and anger and grief. We see this all the time. So be really sensitive, right? When your friend goes, Hey, you know, we broke up after six months or eight months or eight years, and you go, oh, But thank God, we'll just come back anyway, right? Try and remember that's not how they feel. Remember that this is life changing for us. And we've seen this over and over and over. Okay, so be sensitive when somebody says they had a breakup. Death of somebody close to you, right? Especially if it's by suicide. And serious and terminal illness. And this has had a change, especially here in California, where assisted suicide is legal. Okay, so somebody might have a terminal illness and they might want to take their life, but they may not be talking about it in the suicide rate. They may be talking about they're going to get help to take their life. So we have to look at context. We have to look at what's going on. We have to look at what they're doing, okay? So whether it's suicide or whether it's an assisted suicide, okay? Being punished, loss of freedom, loss of financial capabilities, okay? Becoming a burden, okay? It's pretty easy to see, right? Grandma's been living with you. She's got a terminal illness. She can't really do much anymore. She's not participating. She may feel like she's a burden. Okay, so this isn't just in our friends and family our age, but could be in our elderly, okay? Um, humiliation, bullying, exploitation. Is that the one on the college campus? Back to the, yeah. Yeah, absolutely positively. It's called Haley, right? They do it over the internet, right? Social media is full of it. They do it in person. It's junior high, high school, those are probably the worst, but we still see it going in. Okay, loss of the therapist, a counselor, a teacher, we know those are triggers. Okay, so I'm going to hand it off to Allison, and she's going to teach you, you have all those statistics in your brain, you know, you remember all of them, and you have all those kind of facts and figures. Allison's going to tell you, now what do we do, right? What do we do with those? So. All righty, so, <clears throat> excuse me, so ask the question, save a lot. We talked about the importance of asking that question, how that can sort of break the chain of suicide. So um, there's some tips for asking the question. Many of us have never asked somebody if they're thinking about killing themselves before, right? Um, so here are some tips. If you are in doubt, if you're wondering, you're not really sure if the person's thinking about it or not, you don't really know if you should ask them to ask. There is a little voice that's telling you something is not quite right, so go for it. Um, and then if the person is kind of hemming and hawing in their response, be persistent. Don't, don't let it go by the way said, right? Um, you want to talk to the person alone in a private setting as best you can, and make sure that you give yourself enough time to ask the question. That's a big question to ask somebody. And if the answer is yes, there's some follow-up action that needs to be taken, right? So it's not on the fly and all the way or something. It's, it's really a, a, a time that you're making for that person. Um, you want to make sure that you have your resources handy. Um, your booklet here has a lot of resources in it. So does the, um, the card that we've given you inside. We have all kinds of um, good emergency information on, on the brochure from the City Health Center. Um, there's going to be a slide later with some other local information in it that if you have your phone, you can take a picture, you can take notes or whatever too. Um, <clears throat> so remember that it's not really so important how you ask it, but that you ask it, right? We'll, we'll see some exceptions to that, but for the most part, how you ask it is not as important as that you ask. Okay. All right. So 
kind of an indirect approach is have you been really unhappy lately? Have you been very unhappy lately? Have you been so unhappy that you're thinking about killing yourself, committing suicide, or taking your life, something like that? And with kids, they don't really necessarily have the, um, you know, the maturity to think about suicide and death. But so, so you might want to ask it in a different way. Like, do you ever wish that you could go to sleep and never? That's a way that a little child would think maybe about death. And then there's a direct approach, which is, you know, when people are as hurting and as upset as you are, they kind of sometimes think or wish they were dead. And I'm wondering if you're feeling the same way. That's much more direct, right? Um, or are you thinking of killing them? Right? So for a lot of us, that's a little bit scary to say. And that's why in a little, little while we'll practice that a little bit, just so you can get to feeling of that. But it's a really important question to ask, right? And here's the thing, if you can't ask it, find someone who can. All right, so here's how not to ask the question, right? You're not thinking, I would do something. Uh, you wouldn't do anything stupid, would you? Or suicide's a dumb idea. Surely you're not thinking about doing that. Why is that? Why would those be bad ways to ask that question? You think? Yeah. I think it's been the decreases in chances that they're dead. They, they actually open up to you. Like, right. Like they hear that and be like, oh, uh -huh, yeah, of course not. Yeah. And that kind of just shuts the door on that conversation. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like yeah, like you're not stupid, right? Yeah. What else? Any other ideas? Yeah. Yeah, they sh yeah, they sure could. The other thing is you're kind of telescope. Oh, go ahead. You're just putting a negative context on Yeah. Yeah. They wouldn't feel very respected, and you're kind of giving them the right answer. I'm not supposed to want to kill myself, but this person is kind of telling me, you know, that I'm not supposed to want to do that. Yeah, great. You're absolutely right. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Falling down on the job. It was ribbon. Okay. Yeah, well, you know. it was ribbon. All right. So, so, so once you've asked the question, you've got you've gotten the answer. Maybe the answer you know, but you're still worried about the person. So you still want to give them resources, right? Like why are you know why why are, they could still be depressed, just not thinking about suicide. So you still want to help them that, right? But say the answer is yes. The next thing then is the P of QPR, which is persuade. And you want to persuade the person to stay alive, right? So how do you do that? You want to listen to their problem. Remember, we saw that that the blue brain that wasn't making very good decisions, right? Because of the depression or anxiety or the sleeplessness or the not eating or whatever. And so, and so we want to listen to the problem. And a lot of times it's things like, I don't have enough money, I just lost my job, um, I'm feeling really depressed. Uh, you know, um, I just broke up with my boyfriend. What, whatever the thing is, a lot of times when somebody whose brain is firing on all cylinders, that person hears that, they say, oh my gosh, I can help you. I can help you get help for your depression. Um, let's go to the financial aid office and see if we can get some help there for you. Your car broke down and you can't get to work. Let me help you with that. I mean, these sound like really simple solutions and sometimes it is a little oversimplified. But um, sometimes the answers are kind of simple, and it's because the person just isn't really able to plan, able to think about simple solutions, all right? And remember that suicide is not the problem. It's only the solution to the problem. Um, I have a really good friend who's a therapist who always describes suicide as a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And that's a really big way of thinking about it, right? Yeah. Um, also, we just said already, we don't want to judge. The person's really hurting. And we want to take that seriously. But we want to offer hope in any form. You know, 
I can help you. I can help you get to work. I can help you get some help for your suicide, for your uh, uh, anxiety or depression, whatever it is. Most all of us are capable of helping somebody in some way or finding them help, getting them help, right? So, um, so persistent statements that suicide is not a good solution are helpful. Okay, if we can do something that will really solve the problem, that won't really solve the problem. Coming up with healthy alternatives, I mentioned a bunch of those before. I can help you out if you're feeling lonely. You can join us for going to movies or getting a pizza or whatever. Um, uh, accepting the reality of the person's pain, but offer alternatives, right? So over and over, showing respect. We, we've said these. So any hope in any form that you can come along and help the person out. Yep. Okay. So sometimes the solution is to get treatment. Usually the solution is to get treatment of some sort. And um, it often starts with counseling, right? Uh, psychological counseling. And sometimes the person will say, I've tried that and it does not work. And a really good response to that is what if this time it does? I will tell you that a lot of people have been in therapy and they didn't mesh well with their therapists. So maybe they even tried it a couple of times. We know lots of people who've been to several different therapists before they find the one that really connects to them. For whatever reason, it could be the culturally in, you know, uh, 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 inappropriate counselor, or it could be that it was too expensive, or it could be a thousand things, but there are ways now of helping somebody find a therapist that will help them. So that that's, um, and the good news about that is at a, on our campus, we have, first of all, we have free counseling here on our campus, and we also have a really good um case manager who can help me find even more counseling that's appropriate to you in the uh, community. So we have those services available here for uh, for students, right? And, and ways of helping you find help uh, for people that aren't students too. Okay. So um, students can get up to six free sessions per semester in the fall and the spring and four in the summer ish. Mm -hmm. um, but we also really, we find most of our students don't even need their six sessions. They only need a couple a lot of times. And if you need more than that, or you need care that we, um, that we don't offer, like we don't have a psychiatrist, for example, on our campus, or you have something that requires more than six sessions, we act, I said it before, we have a case manager that can help you find the more, more than that out of really Be very excited about that. I usually I ask how many of you even knew we had a student health center on our campus? Yeah, a bunch of times people don't even know. It's right across uh, Raider Walk from this building. When you pay the health fee, you should get, you should take advantage of this. We have a full medical and mental health services, which um, are, are again listed on this little card. But I digress. Thank you so much for asking that question. All right. So now, once you get the instilling hope and, and persuade the person, now the next thing is to refer because remember, we're not counselors, we're not therapists, right? But we know how to help them find therapists and therapy. So um, they often feel like they can't help get find help themselves or get help or be helped the best referral is will you come with me to get help and if you're talking about a student here on this campus that needs your help you can walk them right over to the student health center and we have had students walk students to the health center many times that is a very common thing uh instructors or students talk to students there so we're we're there, we're used to it, we know, we know what we see when we see it, right? So that's a good one. The next um the next way is to um right, the next best is to get a commitment from them um to accept help, right? And that could be that could be somebody that you can't walk to the health center or 
or it happens after hours or on the weekends, or it's somebody that's not a student or whatever have you. Um, and you can give that person resources. You can, you know, you can sit there while they call or something like that, right? That's the kind of the next level. But it's still important. It's a really great idea and very helpful for people. Um, because remember, they're not doing a great job of finding the resources they need at that time. And then um, the third best is to give referral information. Here's here's a brochure for you, right? Um, and then what's good to do in that instance is to say, will you promise not to kill yourself until we found the home? And that sounds crazy, but it's really effective if you can extract the promise from the person not to kill themselves until you can find some help with them. Right? So, the other thing, and we kind of mentioned it earlier about alcohol use or other drug use too, and that is if somebody has been sober for a long time and then relapses, they have a, a higher rate of suicidality, they have a higher rate of suicide ideation and self-harm ideas, right? That's one thing. The other thing is alcohol particularly really lowers the depression threshold, it really lowers the inhibitions. So the people that were sort of had this looming idea of suicide or suicide ideation now have a much lower threshold to it. So uh, 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 I want to say about 30% of all suicides are under the influence of alcohol. It might even be higher than that. I mean, it's really significant, right? So that's an important thing to take into account. All right. So remember I told you we were going to show you some um, different, different resources here. If you have a, a phone or a way to take a picture of that slide, that's great, or write them down. So the suicide hotline is a really good one. Um, we have the 800 number there, but now you can call 988. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, 988. Um, so this is a really good one if you're sitting with somebody who either isn't a student here or it's after hours or whatever, and you're concerned about them, and you're like, you know what, I'm going to sit here with you, I'm going to call 988, and I'm going to talk to them. They, they will talk to you. They'll say, hey, who's the, who are we talking about? What's going on? What are you noticing? And then they'll actually have you hand your friend phone over to the person that you're sitting with. And they'll kind of talk about, they'll talk about it with the person. Um, they'll, you know, they'll ask about, do they have a plan? You know, what, you know, uh, a, a means and those kinds of things. And then they'll talk to you again and say, yeah, I've called, uh, I've called 911 for this person. Or we really think it, that the person's not suicidal, but they do need help. And this is what we suggest and that kind of thing. That's a really great strategy, having talked with somebody about this stuff, right? Um, other ones, we talked about veterans and their high rate of suicide relative to the rest of the population. So if you call the suicide hotline and press one, it goes directly to a veterans line. And that's awesome. A lot of um, uh, a lot of veterans have used that, and it's really saved a lot of lives. The other thing is the Trevor Lifeline. What, what were you talking about yesterday? Can we describe the thing with the Trevor? So Trevor Lifeline is for LGBTQ plus people who who are thinking about suicide or having mental health issues, and a whole lot of others. So oh, one of the health educators was saying yesterday that it was one of those sites where if you hit escape three times quickly, it'll exit you out of it um, rather than having to close it. So if somebody walked in and saw you looking at it, you could hit escape three times and it would exit out really quickly. That it's programmed, I guess, into that site. I never knew that. I never knew, knew that, that either. I have no idea. Yeah. Right, she knows everything. No, she knows all that stuff. Yeah, she's so, so good. So, so, so somebody is looking into kind of deciding or thinking about coming out or not really sure or whatever, and they're doing some investigating, investigation for them or for somebody else. They don't want anybody to know about that yet. Escape, escape, escape will help them get out of there and not get, get out of before they're ready to come out. I think that's fantastic. I'm so excited to hear about that. Um, that seems like a really good safe zone training thing to have known. But anyway, okay. The other one that we love and use a lot 
is the crisis text line. That's a really good one for um, everyone. You can, student or not student, they can text. Um, you don't even have to text courage to it. You could just text whatever you want, 741741. So a lot of times when people are feeling anxious or depressed, it's not conveniently during our business hours, right? A lot of times it's like three in the morning or whatever, and you're worried about a test or you're upset about a breakup or whatever thing that's keeping you up. Um, you can text to a trained staffer or a volunteer anytime, day or night, every day of the year, and somebody will respond to you. Uh, our students love that one. So you say you're the person that you've just talked to has said, no, I'm you know what, I, I'm just having a hard time right now. I'm not thinking about killing myself. I don't think I'm depressed. I'm just having a hard time. This is a great resource to hand that person, right? The 741741. So we also have other kinds of help. Um, we have, excuse me, all kinds of, um, the, you can use 211, which isn't on here. And that... Oh, it, it corresponds to every county you're in, and it will give you um, mental health resources and other kinds of resources. Sometimes it's somebody that's about to get kicked out of their house or something, and you can learn about temporary housing and those kinds of things, or a lack of food, or where, where are the food pantries. So there's a lot of reasons why people could be really upset and really having a hard time that a 211 call would help. We have um, our county crisis. Uh, teams, every county just about, at least in California, has a crisis team. So there are a lot of good resources. Okay. Scott, am I on its own? It's now stuck. All right. So then we were talking about how to help somebody find the resources. And again, if you are a student here or you're helping a student here, the student health center is a really great one-stop shop because we can do all this stuff for you. But if you are if you are talking to somebody who isn't and they're looking for a psychologist or mental health provider, psychologytoday.com has a way of searching for psychologists that would take your insurance or if you're on Medi-Cal, who takes Medi-Cal or who takes cash and, you know, those kinds of things. And then there's another one called inclusivetherapist.com that helps you find, um, <clears throat> excuse me, therapists of any ethnicity or any social group. Um, so those are really great resources um, to use. All right. Other cautionary um, sentence here is if you, you need to think about your safety and the person's safety, right? So, you need to call 911 if a person has a weapon or something that can be used as a weapon. Right? That's that's not you gently going in and asking them what's going on. That's you calling 911 and getting out the harm's way. It's really important. If you're speaking over the phone with a person who is expressing intent to kill themselves, that's a call 911. There's no doubt about that. Okay. It's really good to get the person's location if you can and that sort of thing. That's really important, but calling 911. Um, if there, if you notice an overdose of pills, the person's passed out, you see a lot of liquor bottles out and about, those kinds of things where you have the idea that the person might have blacked out or taken an overdose or has alcohol poisoning, something like that, call them them for that. Okay. Um, and then if you're confronted by a hostile person, somebody who's really, <clears throat> excuse me, coming at you, that's also just get out of Dodge and Point. We don't want you to get hurt helping this person. And we want you to do help that's helpful, right? That's when you need to do that. Okay. It's a good idea to uh, watch where they're going, be able to say where you are when you call them in, but the most important thing is to help yourself stay safe. So they you're safe, but also you can really help the person better. Okay, so almost all efforts to persuade someone to live instead of attempt suicide will be met with agreement or relief. So don't get involved to take the lead. I am not kidding you. Tina said it earlier, and I'm going to say it again. People are kind of relieved when you ask them 
that they're thinking of killing themselves when they're appearing really down. Sometimes they'll say, yeah, you know, I really have been thinking about that. Or sometimes they're relieved that they weren't thinking about that. So don't be afraid to ask the question. Don't be afraid to ask the question. Right. So um, say, I want you to live. I'm on your side. Get others involved. Here's a really important thing. Who's important to you? Who have you been talking to? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, are you living with family? Are you involved in a church? Is there a group? Is there a significant other I can talk to to, to help me help you? Right. That's that's a really important one. Um, joining the team, the team, so to speak, offering to say, yeah, I can get you to therapy. I can get you to the food pantry. I can help you get that car, that tire changed on your car or whatever. And then the other thing is after you've done these helping behaviors, following up to see how the person is doing in a week or so, you know, they, they, they won't feel like it was just a one-time deal. They'll feel like you're committed to therapy better. Okay. Great. So now we're going to practice, all right? So it's not enough, just like with CPR, right? Just, to, just like CPR, you, it's not enough to just talk about it and watch the video, right? You have to try the, the, the practice here. So I'd like everybody to get into dyads, so twos, right? So let's see, maybe these two and these two and these two. And, do you know what I mean? So I don't need to mic right now and you're pairing off, but just get into pairs if you would. And then I think we may have one of the props. Maybe we have one. Yeah, so we'll have to have somebody do like a team of three. And then we'll... Um, and then we're going to give you these uh, papers. So one of you is going to be the first who's having a hard person, right? And this is the person who helps. So this is a, so um, are you choosing to work on your own? Oh, maybe the two of you true? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so um, we'll have one of you be the gatekeeper and one of you be the struggle with the big deal on the client side. We'll okay. Have one of you have one shape for it, Peter. So, any question? Who would persuade? Okay, and don't you use? Okay, I really guys do Oh, you're so you want to go there? Oh, no, behind you. So, oh, well, there's somebody here that doesn't have a key. Yeah, it's for a bit. So these these three over here are the trio. So yeah. Okay. Everybody got a partner? You guys got a two and two. All right. Can you do that? Okay. So you've got a partner. Whoops. And so you guys don't have any paper. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I didn't miss that. So if you are the troubled individual, you're gonna just take a couple minutes to read what's troubling you, right? And then if you're the gatekeeper, you're going to kind of read over what your goal is. And then when you're ready, you're just going to have a little combo with each other and see how it unfolds. So the goal for the gatekeeper is to get to the point where you ask the person what they're thinking of killing themselves, right? That's the whole point of this is to get to that point. So let, does anybody have any questions about that? Yeah. yeah, you can start. She might even say, Hey, how's it going? And then, you know, well, have, that's sort of just a rough outline of your lines. Okay. All right. So go ahead and get started. Raise your hand if you have any questions. So, yeah. <laughs> No, I you 
Yeah, we were saying that we wish we had known that it wasn't because we were too scared to like even the house, like when it started. You know, we're like, oh, I wish we had a take an advantage of it better. Like, you know, not knowing, I don't know how long it was going to last. And like, we could have gone somewhere and like had all of our classes done remotely, like up in Northern California, where we all got to be. But we didn't feel safe. I mean, I didn't feel safe from like, no, she should not. Right, right, right. Yeah, because we made the right choice. But every now and then we're like, oh, I wish we had known it was as scary as we thought of it. Yeah, I the thing I regret is so sorry. It feels weird, you know, there's still whenever we go to the doctor or like therapy or any of those like Kaiser places, you have to wear a mask. But that's like yeah. the only place, you know. I don't know. Yeah, we'll probably wear this forever. Um, the doctor will too. So, you know, you know, worst things, honestly, if you're going to catch it, first thing, it's Hi, right. Come on. What's the best case? Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's more. Yeah. 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 Yeah.